Our scripture today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Actually, verses 1 through 12. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When God saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. God said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hizzites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. It was just another ordinary Friday night in Los Angeles. Jacob and I were out to dinner with three of my friends from grad school. It was a Thai place, and it had long farmhouse-style community tables. Our food had just been delivered plates heaping with steaming rice and big bowls of noodle soup and platters of spring rolls. And we had ordered a bottle of organic natural wine, determined to decide for ourselves if that was the same or different from unnatural inorganic wine. <laughs> the restaurant was crowded and it was loud. And all of a sudden, there was an earthquake. It was the kind of earthquake that made the ground feel like we were on a rickety rowboat in the middle of an ocean storm. Some people refer to these as rolling earthquakes. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. You've experienced one of these. There's my Californian community. They feel very different from the earthquakes that are like a giant garbage truck just hit the side of the building or the ones that feel like a toddler picked up the building like a piggy bank and shakes it. You all know what I'm talking about. There's scientific terms for these, of course, primary, secondary, surface waves. But again, we all live in California. We all know the difference. Now, this particular earthquake lasted longer than usual, and a hush fell over the noisy restaurant as we all swayed to and fro, sliding back and forth on these long benches, and our food was sliding back and forth as if it couldn't decide who it belonged to. The wait staff all paused what they were doing and cocked their heads and looked at each other, not sure if they should continue serving or wait it out. And there were these crystal beads hanging in curtains in the restaurant, and they all started clinking. <laughs> Finally, everything stopped, and everyone erupted into nervous laughter, like you do in California after an earthquake. <laughs> and gradually, the volume increased back to a boisterous, noisy night in LA. Oh, it was an earthquake, we all said. And then we proceeded to discuss every detail of every earthquake we've experienced up to that point. We all know this is what you do. This is what you do. And I noticed as we ate our food right after that, whether it was the quality of the restaurant or the company of old friends or that organic natural wine or the earthquake's reminder of our mortality, the air seemed to sparkle with life that night. The curries were extra spicy. The green beans were extra crunchy. The soup was extra tangy. All of our jokes were extra funny. And those crystal beaded curtains reflected the light and the whole room kind of felt starlit. Everyone just seemed more alive than they had when we sat down at the beginning of that meal. This night, this meal with friends, I thought to myself, turned out to be holy ground all along. 
We just needed a reminder. For Moses, it started out as just another ordinary day at work, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep in the desert. But suddenly he saw a burning bush and he heard the voice of God calling his name. And God said, remove your sandals for this is holy ground. Moses had probably passed that bush a hundred times, day after day, month after month, year after year. And he had always thought it was just a bush. This was just a path. But in that moment, he could see it was holy ground. And it had been holy ground all along. Now, I'm always curious how others imagine these Bible scenes. And so I found four different artist renderings of this famous moment to share with you this morning. The first is by uh, Domencino. I know it's a little bit hard to see. It's a little dark. He's an Italian painter. This was painted in 1610, and I like it. Although, to be honest, the landscape is so serene and big that it makes the burning bush in the bottom left corner feel just like a little campfire. And um, you can't really see this very well, but Moses is like doing a duck and cover from it. And I feel like that's over dramatic given the size of the burning bush compared to the serenity of the rest of the painting. The next one is by Domenico Fetti, another Italian artist, completed in 1615, so about the same time as the other painting. And I like this one because it captures the moment when Moses is removing his sandals. And if you look in the bottom left, there's a sheep in the corner, which is a nice touch to remind us he was just out herding these sheep, doing his job as a shepherd when this burning bush comes to him. And now, I will say my, criti my critique of this one is that the burning bush on the right side looks kind of like those 4th of July like rocket launchers. They're kind of like coming out at a weird angle. That's not how I imagine it, but, you know, artist choice. The third depiction is by Marc Chagall. He is a Jewish artist from modern-day Belarus who painted this in 1966 as part of a 24-part series on the book of Exodus. In Chagall's version, Moses is holding his hand over his heart in a humble posture of servitude, and the burning bush, you can see in Hebrew, is speaking its name, Yahweh, because that is how God reveals God's self to Moses in this scene, and his, the name is I am that I am, and that is the tetragrammaton, if we're going to be really technically correct, is Yahweh. So that bush is speaking in this painting, and I really like that one. Now, finally, I wanted to share Salvador Dali's depiction of this scene. This was painted in 1967. Dali was a Spanish surrealist painter, and he titled this piece, The Bush That Was Not Burnt. Okay, it disappeared, but you saw it. A devout Catholic Italian couple, the Alberettos, became Dali's close friends and greatest patrons, and they commissioned over a hundred works of Bible scenes in hopes of forcing Dali to reconcile his own religious wrestlings. Now, in my experience, it does not work well to pressure your friends to convert to Christianity, but the results are some of the most stunning scenes from Scripture. And Okay, it's, it's doing some funny, magical things here. But of all the four paintings that I showed you this morning with Moses' encounter of God as a burning bush, that one makes me feel the most feels, as the young people say today. Um, it's sort of this, like, splattery, surrealist image. And I think it's because this story is so rich with mysticism and supernatural effects that I felt like Dolly's captured it the best. So... Whether you are discouraged with trying to find something significant to do with your life, or you've been wounded by friends or family members, or whether you've decided that your goals and dreams are too unrealistic to pursue anymore, you may decide to stop trying so hard and instead just settle into a quiet, simple life, a safe routine like a shepherd on ordinary ground. The problem is that this story claims there is no such thing as ordinary ground. You've always been on holy ground. And our culture has accepted a distinction between the sacred and the secular. We think that church and mountaintops and maybe Dodger Stadium are holy places. <laughs> Those are sacred, but everything else is secular and mundane and ordinary. 
But that separation is completely unknown in the Bible. Our ancestors considered all places to be God's places. All of creation is God's creation, and thus it is all sacred. Now, we humans can certainly profane the sacred, as we do with things like words and money, but it is all still sacred by design. All ground is holy because it was created by a holy, loving creator. And so even though we may be tempted at times in our lives, there's no place to run away from God. There's no place to hide from the holy dreams of your life. A professor of mine once phrased it, everywhere you go, there you and God are. But even more importantly, when you realize you're standing on holy ground, you're able to hear the call of God. It's never just a burning bush. It's never just an office cubicle or a minivan. It's never just a garden that needs weeded. It's never just a coffee date with a friend or a quick grocery store run or a weekend hangout with friends. It is all holy ground. And once we can tune into that reality, we can hear God calling us. We don't go somewhere to find God. We discover how God is already at work in our lives, and then we are called to follow wherever she leads. If we go too long wandering around, God usually tries to get our attention, sometimes by way of burning bushes or earthquakes, sometimes by way of a child's hand reaching for yours, sometimes by way of a colleague confiding in you. Sometimes God gets your attention with a diagnosis that flattens you. Sometimes by way of a friend giving you a hug when you're feeling depressed. Whatever form the burning bush takes, it serves to stop you in your tracks and invites you to take a second look and realize you were standing on holy ground all along. After establishing her presence, God tells Moses she's heard her people cry out in Egypt and she says, I have come down. Perfect, Moses thinks. It's about time God came down here to sort all this out. And we might think the same in our lives. But then God continues, and that, Moses, is why I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of slavery. Oh, oh, that's the plan. Okay, it involves me. Oh, got it. Okay. Once we realize we're standing on holy ground, we begin to hear God's call to us. And we realize that we are the ones called to bring hope to one another in times of hopelessness. It turns out we are the ones called to comfort one another in times of grief. We are the ones called to cry out in the face of injustice, to lean into the messiness of life and not turn our backs on those who need our help. We are the ones who are called to not be silent when things need spoken out about. And Moses responded to that calling by saying, well, who am I? And that's such a fair question. Who was a shepherd in the face of Pharaoh? And who are you and I in the face of a violent, divided world? Who are you and I in a, a world filled with need and cynicism and despair? You may say, you're just an accountant trying to close this month's books. You're just a grad student trying to finish your thesis. You're just a retired person whose years of productivity are behind you. You're just a parent trying to make it to tomorrow without losing your marbles. But God says to Moses, oh, but I'll be with you. And that is the same promise that we receive from God when we are called to something new. I'm calling you to participate in the redemption of the world and I'll be with you. God calls you to stand up to the pharaohs of this world, to pursue justice, to fight racism, to face the things that have gone wrong and make them right, to heal strained relationships, to be the adult in the face of immaturity, to stay calm when the world around you feels topsy-turvy, to sacrifice something of yourself for the good of someone else. I'm not saying this is easy work, friends, but I am saying this is holy work, and this is the work we are called to do. If you think, who am I? Know that God will be with you whatever challenges lie ahead. God calls us 
because God trusts that together, God and us, God's people, can stand up to Pharaoh. Together we can live toward that promised day when justice will roll down like waters and weapons are turned into gardening tools and our children will grow up to be neither oppressors nor the oppressed. I was at dinner last night celebrating the birthday of one of my favorite people who also happens to be the new director of children, youth, and families here at the church, Nancy Felix. And she said at dinner, one thing I love the most about being a person of faith is that it causes us to be aware of the holy moments that happen around us all the time. I love that so much. The story of Moses reminds us that it is all holy ground, that God is present even in the mundane. And if we just tune in and pay attention, we can see God and recognize God at work and even hear God's call on our lives. And like Nancy said, as Christians, this should be our daily practice. We should get really good at this, recognizing that it's all holy ground and listening for God's call. That's kind of our thing. So it doesn't matter how young or how old you may be. It doesn't matter how many doubts or questions you have. It doesn't matter if you wonder every day, who am I? You are standing on holy ground in your lives. You've been standing on holy ground all along. And God is not nearly done with your life. And she will be with you always. <laughs>